All right, we're back up. Yeah, I think there's one near our hotel, so I'm gonna, we're gonna stop by. <laughs> yeah. um, Cynthia, we're back on? We're back the on. Live stream. Yep. So for, for those of you who are just joining us, we're sorry if we had the orientation on our, our live stream a little schweco, but we're having a really great conversation led by Amanda Edwards here in, in Houston with small business owners and entrepreneurs. And we're just about to hear from Fern, um, who's gonna tell us a little bit about, um, Amanda, how did you pose the question? Uh, was it challenges? Yeah. Yes, it challenges as a small business owner, minority woman business owner, uh, and accessing capital, scaling your business, what sure. your unique journey was. Yeah, so w what was unique about my journey was that accessing capital and scaling my business sort of happened at the same time we entered into a pandemic. So I kind of did it all at once. And so the many challenges you know, presented uh, themselves during that time. Um, to nutshell it, I'll say this, in, in the event of any kind of a crisis, entrepreneurs generally have to figure it out on their own. As a franchise owner, there is a bit of a luxury, right, because I have this larger national brand that's able to sort of figure out the big pivots, like online ordering and like updating the app and all that. I didn't have to physically figure that out for my own business, right? I was able to lean on the franchise order for that, right? Um, figuring out curbside ordering. So there was some benefit to being connected to a franchise. However, you know, it, it's still on me to figure out capital. I was building new stores and all this. Well, when, when everything shut down, um, you know, the first thing I think most business owners do to try to access capital is they leverage their own personal credit, right? It's the first, it's, the, it's readily available. You need cash now, whether it is to manage payroll or to get access to additional inventory or whatever, to deal with whatever is coming at you. And so then as this pandemic sort of progresses, you know, it's like, okay, we'll shut down for two weeks and three weeks and six weeks and this goes on. Um, you know, you come down there on the pike and you're trying to, you know, move forward and get access to working capital and everybody knows a bank wants to give you money when you have the money, when your credit score is perfect and all this. So you walk into a, a, a typical bank and you're like, hey, my credit's been leveraged, but look, my sales, my revenues are strong. I have drive throughs you know, even though we shut down our lobby, we're still making money, we're doing well. And many of them were still like, oh, but you're a restaurant, you know, like then, then no one was really interested in lending to restaurants and you saw banks start to be afraid of that. And so, um, you know, there are CDFIs and other ways that you can access capital. Many of them are still underwritten by, you know, uh, traditional lenders that still want to see sort of, you know, the traditional markers at credit score and other things, which we know can be prejudicial for so many reasons. And you don't get the, the capital that you need right away. But there is a huge market of merchant cash advance lenders that are out there with 30 and 40% interest that look at your sales and they see how much money you're making and then they start debiting your account every day. It's completely just based on your sales or whatever. Mm -hmm. And while that may give you the capital because they will fund you same day, you know, um, you know, while you're waiting, for example, for an EIDL or a PPP loan, which could take, you know, months or with, in the case of the EIDL, almost a year before they've approved some people, you know, you might've taken the risk of like, I'll take on this 30% interest money. Hopefully I'll get my EIDL and be able to pay it back. But that wasn't the reality. So you end up living with this really expensive debt and trying to manage it all. So it's been difficult. I think what I'll say to wrap this is just that what we've seen is that, you know, the federal government and I'm sure state governments have figured out how they can operate like a bank because that's essentially what the federal government's doing through the SBA. And so I don't, I don't profess the inner workings about how that, uh, you know, uh, would work, but I would think that the government, even a state government, could figure out a pipeline to be able to be the bank for its local business owners. Um, to um, provide quicker access to capital, emergency capital to um, to its uh, entrepreneurs and business owners um, in its state so that we can get those funds quicker. Because you know, a 30 day, 60 day, 90 day closing is just not an option when you have a, a, you know, a situation like a pandemic. That's, that's really helpful to hear. And I wonder if LaShonda, if you could tell us from the perspective of a CDFI, um, how we meet some of the, the challenges that Fern just posed. And would you say on, on capital, is it primarily um, capital to start up? Is it capital to operate or is it capital to expand? And I know that's a tricky question yeah. in, in the midst of COVID because a lot of people just needed capital to survive. To survive. Sure. Um, but but um, what what of those three do you think is most consistently the greatest need? And I'd love LaShonda to, to talk a little bit about how we meet that. I think it's probably hardest for working capital now, right? Because you're, when you need working capital now, it's because you're struggling or there's something that's gone on, something has broken that you need to fix, it's expensive or you need to manage payroll. And I think that a lender is like, oh, you're in trouble and you need money, so mm -hmm. oh no, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> stay away. Oh, stay away. <laughs> so inherently there's this ish, there's this disconnect, right? But then in, in, in my case, I also had an agreement with Sneaky King to build these other stores and I needed to get those started. But necessarily with each individual, 
individual franchise. They look at you, banks will look at you as a startup each time. Mm. So I can't say I've been owning and operating the Smoothie King that's been rocking and rolling for seven years. When I opened the next one, they're looking at me as a startup. Brand so new. then I'm starting Brand all new. over again. Sure, and it works in the inverse where if maybe I've ha I'm having trouble now keeping this business afloat, even though the revenues are high, we need to, you know, we need some help here. If you're looking at my business credit or my personal credit with attached there to get this one too, then I still am kind of like, or we don't, you know, so it's, it's just, a, you're kind of blackballed all the way around. Yeah, there's so much there. It's like you were talking, I'm like, oh my goodness, all the things were going on, right? All the things. So it, it, for me, it's several things, right? So if you kind of talk about the before and then the during, right? And so we're kind of still during, I don't think we've quite gotten to the after yet, right? So, in terms of the, the before, you know, so many businesses really were already operating at a place of vulnerability. And so coming in with constrained cash flows, coming in with, you know, challenges around systems and documentation and et cetera, all of the things that are essentially barriers to being able to access capital. Sure. And then the pandemic just amplified those things tremendously, right? And so, you know, to the point that Fern was making, coming to a bank when you're kind of already under is very mm -hmm. challenging. Right, and as a CDFI, we have the, the fortunate position of being able to kind of come into that space where you know businesses are not able to uh, connect with traditional banking institutions, but are able to connect with the CDFI and to be able to access capital. Now, again, there's still limits even with that, right? Because still, it's a lending institution, and so being able to demonstrate that you can repay that involves lots of things. But one of the wonderful things that you know we're able to do is to fill that gap by being able to look at things like credit score, look at things like credit history, look at things like how the cash flows are moving, as well as just understanding who the business owner is, understanding their connectivity to the community, mm -hmm. understanding the value of those chain of businesses and the jobs that they retain and create, being able to pull all of those things together um, to put together some sort of package that kind of supports that business where they are. Um, is really, really critical. And I would say you kind of asked, you asked several questions, right? <laughs> so there was the like, how do we support that? Mm. Uh, by being able to, you know, really leverage that state level resource, network, information to be able to support institutions like CDFIs. Uh, because many, many businesses, we learned in PPP, they didn't have relationships beforehand. Right. And so you're at a disadvantage without the relationships, without the systems in place, without the documentation, all, I mean, we can just keep going on and on and on, right? And that's just a compounding of issues when it comes to an emergency. You need capital now, right? And capital doesn't come to government entities until, you know, we're, people are just now spending Harvey money. I mean, it was 2017, yeah. right? Yeah. So I can't wait four years for you yeah. to figure out how to give me a dollar when my business is like in need of it now, right? Yeah. So being able to really bring those resources directly to CDFIs who can directly then, in a really timely fashion, get dollars out the door door for PPP. So in, well, I don't know, was that 12 months, 18 months? At this point, I don't know. All the time's <laughs> yeah, running together. Yeah. But between 2020 and 2022, we deployed $50 million. And for us, that's a tremendous amount of <laughs> dollars. And in Texas, we did $5.5 million. And as I mentioned, we're new to Texas. So for us, we're very proud of that. But that was over 600 businesses. So we're talking about little bitty dollars, mm -hmm. some bigger, but a lot of small dollars. And those businesses, literally, if they didn't have the so that's where we like to try to come in and be able to work with a business, first of all, before the trend goes too far down, sure, right? Sure. And also to help businesses on the other side, because not just the capital is important, it's what do you do with the capital, people understanding that, like, why are you taking that money out, right? Is it for a purpose, a sure. strategic purpose, it's to grow and scale the business, it's to do something very specific, i.e. make money, yeah. right? And so if you're not doing those things, then likely, you're not really using that, those dollars effectively and, and in the longer term and sometimes in the short term are really damaging your business. And so being able to kind of catch people before they get caught up in predatory lending, yeah. um, before their debt and the things that they're doing kind of dig the whole bigger, yeah, it's right. kind of like, let's patch the hole or let's just stop. <laughs> let's let's yeah. stop moving yeah. right now and let's figure out what you need currently, where you are, what is the strategy for your business, what do you anticipate things uh, where do you anticipate things going in terms of you know sales and revenue, et cetera? But also, let's talk a little bit about like some of those things that are on the back end that are really going to sustain your business. Having dollars to spend today is great, but if you don't have a plan for those dollars, if you don't have the system to really go about tracking those dollars, you can't come back to you know whether it was a grant or a loan. You can't really come back to another institution and say, hey, I need more money, and those dollars just kind of 
went by the wayside. You don't really have a way to speak about how they built your business yeah. and how you can leverage them. Mm -hmm. I think that's where the, the alliance comes into place, right? Because as I'm listening to them, we sit in a different space. We sit across from both of those, right? So um, we, we looked at it, and, and so representing you know these 800 businesses, most of them are doing business with governmental entities and private sector companies. And so um, there was this big challenge as said, of capital. So if we look at our businesses in Houston, um, at, in, in our council, two-thirds are professional service firms. Mm -hmm. So corporations weren't giving professional service contracts. Typically, those are the things that first go away as the business starts to go down. And so those businesses were saying, well, I'm not generating the revenue that I had. The projects that I have have been put on hold. I was just about to start on, on, on something. So we tried to look at it as how could we help from both ends? So we worked with the county, we worked with the port, we worked with other entities to get money out there immediately. I think a, a big opportunity for the, the state is to be able to do that on a larger scale, mm -hmm. to be able to leverage organizations and be able to get that money out on the street. So when we looked at the criteria, for instance, even the county, when they were doing $10,000 loans, we had some minority businesses who were part of that underwriting process uh, under um, Houston Galveston Area Council. And when we looked at the criteria that they were using and the credit score that they were expecting some of these small businesses to have, we're like, even for $10,000, some of them don't meet this guideline. So why are we arbitrarily picking this number to try to get money out to these small businesses? So on the flip side, we started to work with um, other organizations. So we worked with the National uh, Black Banking Association to say, how do you guys process PPP and IDLE? and leverage some of this money through minority banks like Unity Bank and others that we might have here in, in Houston and in Texas and say, how do we get that money out to the community? How do we give money to the CDC? So when we money in minority banks, how hard is that so that those banks are in the community, they understand the needs of the businesses in those communities, and then they have better lending capacity and what I, I can't speak for LaShonda in general, but I know that most CDFIs that we work with have a very low default rate. These businesses just need the capital. Absolutely. It's not that they're not gonna pay it back. But the standards that we put in, in place are going under the assumption that we're not gonna get our money back. But those businesses and those minority banks in those minority communities are taking a chance. They understand the banks, they understand, or they understand the businesses in their area and they're willing to do that investment. And so I think that that's important. Um, we also work with uh, our private sector to say, y'all gotta come up with better payment terms. So the businesses that you are doing business with, they can't take a 120 day term. So we work with Exxon, they're now doing 15 day turnaround for invoices with their diverse suppliers. So you have to be certified to, to do that. Um, we have, uh, we just had a, a session um, with Meta Hi. <laughs> <laughs> on, uh, on their, um, their fast track invoicing program that they just rolled out. They're sitting on cash. So instead of uh, factoring and having a larger percent, they will only take 1% um, which is, of uh, invoices and give you the cash in three days at the max, knowing that you need to have that capital. And that 1% isn't going to Meta, but it's going to a minority firm that's doing all the processing. So it's about making sure that minority businesses can turn around those invoices, turn around that capital, and reinvest it into their business. And so as we talk about positioning minority businesses from a government standpoint, I believe that it's really important as we have this ARPA money coming down, the infrastructure money coming down, that we have opportunities, huge opportunities to invest in minority businesses and in black businesses to be able to be part of that development and growth. So what we need to do is make sure that those businesses know about the opportunity, that there are disparity studies put in place um, so that there are contract opportunities that take into account the amount of minority business participation that could be handed leverage that. Um, that when that money comes down from the state, I know that I love them too, GLO. <laughs> but I will say that sometimes when the money comes from the general land office, it takes a long time for that money to work its way through the system to get down to those businesses that need it. And so we need the state to be more effective and efficient in getting dollars down from the top. It's a $10 million and, and, dollar and opportunity. And just to, so that nobody loses this point, tell us about the significance of why do we need to put more support out there for, uh, for this.
most, I don't think most people understand the underpinning of disparity studies and the ability to then have a supported MWBE program. Absolutely. So I think disparity studies are the basis for uh, which minority women uh, business programs can be created, especially on the public sector. So whether it's a school district, um, a um, the metro, the city, all of those have to be underpinned with a disparity study that looks at the was less than ten percent for minority-owned businesses and less than one percent for black-owned businesses. Yes. And I think the important piece there also to build on what Ingrid is talking about is it's not just the access, right? It is definitely the access to contracts. It's the ability to understand the value of really generating economic development by leveraging the power of small businesses that are in the community. But those businesses don't necessarily have opportunity to take advantage mm -hmm. without capital, right? Mm -hmm. So again, I have to circle us back mm -hmm. to bringing capital to the marketplace through entities like a true fund, a CDFI that can actually get dollars to businesses so that they can mobilize on those opportunities. Because no matter how quick the payout is, it's not before you do the work. Mm -hmm. So it's always gonna be after mm -hmm. you do the work. And so the ability to have that capital to be able to do what you need to do, you talked about mm -hmm. having these different contracts, needing to do your build outs, et cetera. You know, that's what we have found is, has been a major gap and a major need is that businesses need the money up front. And that's actually one of the products that we provide. And that's something that is just critical to be able to bring those dollars to contractors so that they can uh, really get started. They can leverage the capacity that they do have. They can take advantage of those opportunities, making sure that they have that connectivity, i.e. being, you know, that's one of those opportunities, being able to connect with an Ingrid and H and SBC, which has very specific knowledge and relationships bringing all those things together with the access to the capital so that they can get started on those contracts and they build off of that, right? But I so then, think it's just all or nothing. So I, I often have to try to remind people that minority businesses don't, one size doesn't fit all. Absolutely. So we have businesses that we represent that are what you would consider the micro enterprises. And then we have businesses who are over $50 million in mm -hmm. revenue. So I just met with one of our minority firms that uh, was responsible, was the architect um, for uh, one of the new water treatment facility plants. So that was a $1.8 billion project. So you have minority businesses who have the money, mm -hmm. they have the experience, they have the capability, but what they don't have is the opportunity to respect. Mm -hmm. And so what we're all working on is get to know other businesses outside of those that are in sort of your cocoon of who you know, who you've always done business with, that's always the most comfortable. But there are tons of qualified businesses out there that just need the access to be able to get in there. So both capital is important, but access is just as important. And in order to be able to get that access, especially on the public side, you have to have these disparity studies. Based on exactly. how important, that, that, makes, that makes a lot of sense. I will ask this. Yeah. One of my ask is, um, we just were talking about this recently um, at um, Harris County, but maybe perhaps it's a fund that the state would have so that entities, disparity studies are expensive, but there are entities who have done it. So you can leverage through interlocal agreements um, the data that has already been put forward by the city when they did their disparity study, the data that's already been done by Metro or the port and be able to let governmental entities leverage from that and be able to have those disparity studies because the school districts are struggling for money, they're not gonna have a couple hundred thousand and say, well, you know what, we know this is the right thing to do, but we're gonna pull out of the classroom and put that money into a disparity study. Right. So we need to support them in getting That's one of the things that we're supporting too. So we're, um, we are the Code for America Brigade in Houston as well, so Code for Houston, but we're um, advocating for more open data. Right, so how do you aggregate all of this data together so anybody can kind of mark it and see what yes. what kind of disparities exist, uh, where are gaps, and, and where are resources needed? The last disparity study that I can find online for the state of Texas is September 2008. Mm -hmm. So, and the state of Texas did that? Texas, yeah. okay. So, you can think about how much our state has changed mm -hmm. in the traffic and in their economic potential since September 2008. You see that. Uh, when you look at the hub numbers, I pulled them this morning, um, looking at where we are. The 2021 numbers have, out of the uh, total spend in the state of Texas, 10% total for 
um, have found is that you know there's the emergency capital and then there's sort of you know ongoing working capital needs and so businesses have both of those needs often we just learned in the pandemic right yeah. <laughs> where they are still in need of both of those things right the sort of recovery dollars but also operational dollars and they are not the same thing and so being able to have dollars available that are really committed to you know because CDFI is a nonprofit organization, mm -hmm. and so we're not depositors typically, and so you know the money has to be raised, and so really the capital is only there if we're able to connect with it and raise it, right? And so there's still some constraint there, and so really building the capacity of the entities that serve small businesses that are connected to the businesses that really need access to the capital is important as well. So I think the capacity building across the spectrum in terms of different types of organizations that are directly supporting small businesses, specifically businesses of color, uh, I think is just gonna be critical. Otherwise, you know, you can continue to kind of talk about these good faith efforts, but without very intentional um, initiatives, leveraging things like the $10 billion coming into the state, I think it's just a missed opportunity. It's an opportunity to really unleash. There's so many businesses in the informal economy and communities of color that really all they need is access to you know, the information, access to the capital to formalize their business and leverage what is already really a real and thriving business, it's just not really formalized. So for them, it's difficult to go and access capital without that formalized piece, as well as some of the other businesses that are thriving, right, but still also need access to capital for growth. So I think it's a full oh, spectrum so conversation. So if I could just point out yeah. one of our entrepreneurs, Justin, yeah. can you share a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey in that regard in terms of not only just accessing capital, but also some of the supply chain <laughs> issues you've had and, and how that connects to kind of what can be done. And we, so, we have about 15 minutes left. Um, it's, you know, I consider myself pretty financially literate. I used to work on IPOs and all types of capital markets transactions when I was in uh, working for a firm full time. And, you know, switching over to the entrepreneur side, you know, it was a complete uh, kind of gut check. Of that you know, there was a bank that won't be named that I was doing business with personally uh, for probably 20 years at that point. And when I went to just get you know a small $10,000 line of credit, now granted I had significantly more than that with this bank. I know you can see my account. <laughs> <laughs> and it, you know, they, they you know push over to me a 60-page you know stack for you know an SBA loan. And the SBA loan does you know great things, but you really want me to do all of that for, for just the 10,000 of that you know. I'm trying to run this business over here. And, and this ten thousand is not going to rapidly change, you know, the way that I do it. Um, so that was kind of a, a crash course in that you know things are a lot different on this side. For sure. And you know, was fortunate enough to uh, find a bank that was willing to uh, you know give me that room uh, without as much uh, work on my side. Uh, but you know, even then, once uh, you know COVID happens and, and there's PPP loans and it's you know, and I had a relationship with my person, with the banker, and you know, I call and they're like, oh, we're not processing PPP loans. Well, like, you're my only bank. I just don't know who I go talk to. And, and, you know, thanks to, you know, the work with uh, Amanda, I've been able to kind of be in the room and, you know, ear hustle some things. That <laughs> also, but, you know, if, if not for, for that opportunity, if Amanda let me be in the room, you know, I wouldn't know what CDFI is. That, that doesn't come up in running my business. Um, so it, it's, you know, like you said, it's access to capital, it's access to information. And then I, I think what Amanda was alluding to as far as kind of supply chain, um, COVID was a whirlwind in a lot of ways for my business. We're primarily online sales. So that part is actually experienced a little bit of an uptick. We have people that weren't going to stores that are now looking more online. Um, but, it, you know, my, the supply chain in my industry is very fragmented. Um, and I need to supply diversity. Um, until um, I was driving down 59 uh, and see this huge stack of smoke, didn't think much about it. I get a call an hour later and said my manufacturer burned to the ground. Oh and it's all of these things are like, okay, well, I certainly was not prepared for this. <laughs> um, but you know, then the kind of the whirlwind that that put me through of it's not only okay now as someone who doesn't have a ton of capital. I had, had plenty enough capital, I had planned for every contingency with the manufacturer that I had. Mm -hmm. Now I have to go out into the wild, mm -hmm. and I don't have that relationship. And you know, a lot of places don't even want to take a call because they've never heard of you. Yeah. Um, you know, this is booming for some of their larger clients, so it, it just was a, 
it's been about a 14 month process in terms of landing with a supplier that will not only take me on, but will continue to take me seriously and not just continue to push me to the end of the queue because there are clients, uh, you know, have needs as well. And were you able to do that? I have, yeah. Okay. It's, um, it's taken some cross, cross state travel. Luckily, I was able to stay in state. My next move was to have to try to go to California if it didn't work out, but we were able to find someone in Dallas that can help us. Great. What, what has it been like for, um, for each of you in terms of workforce? And we hear that from a lot of small businesses right now that during the, the pandemic and the recession that followed, um, they had a hard time being able to maintain you know, their, their payroll, had to let employees go. And now as business picks back up again, as people are coming into retail establishments or maybe they're buying more of your products online, you need to, to hire up. Is, is that the case? For your businesses and if so have you been able to find the employees that you need we know throughout texas businesses are really struggling as they attempt to hire right now i wonder what you all have experienced um I'll, it has been quite the challenge i think that what you've heard reported has been true i can attest to that um so by way of example i have i use a service that uh, constantly like pulls applications for me so that way I don't ever have to like post when I need somebody so I can just go and they rank order applications for me I just go into the system I can see who's applied I've been in business seven years every month I get at least 30 applications and then there was one point that for two months no one applied and my workforce so for me specifically these are just 16 to 25 year olds right and working in a smoothie place and so um, I no one had applied for almost two months. And so then you find yourself managing differently. So employees you have that maybe show up late where you know you had a three strikes you're out rule or whatever, you're like, what's going on? <laughs> 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 Do you need me to Uber you or <laughs> that? You know what I mean? Um, so a lot of that's going on. No, seriously, it's changed the conversation that I've had with employees, things that I would not have put up with two years ago, you're putting up with now. And then you What see, are you hearing from them? I'm really interested sure. in, in the decisions that they're making. Um, what, what, what do they need? Uh, what are they telling you that uh, allows them to make the decision to stay with you or to sign on with you in the first place? So the interesting thing is that many of them aren't really sharing, right? So what I found a lot of times where people were either applying for jobs and then either showing up for the first day of work and not leaving, or excuse me, and then not showing up for the first day and then leaving after training. And I, what I heard through the grapevines and not, because these folks will never, they don't tell you directly what's going on. But I've heard that there's this thing like if I can get this, you know, this assistance, if I show that I'm applying for a job or that I was mm -hmm. working or that I have to sit there working. So there, you could tell there's a bit of a game in the system. And I don't mm -hmm. profess to exactly how that was going on, but it was happening because people would apply, show up for the first day or not show up at all, don't come, work for two weeks, get one paycheck leave. Um, at one point they weren't interested in working at all. And then you saw other businesses like mine that, you know, you know, with minimum wage workers or whatever, doing things like McDonald's with $500 sign-on bonuses. So now you're competing with that. And you're running a business where you, you, you know, you hire a younger population to start a job. And it's difficult, the margins don't really let you compete with those sorts of things. So that becomes a challenge as well. I mean, you try to increase their pay when you're in a pandemic and your supply costs are going up. Even Smoothie King was having supply chain issues too and had to find other manufacturers. So I can only imagine what it was like for you. You're, and all that trickles down to the franchise franchisee and the royalties of all these things are increasing mm. and you're trying to also increase your you know what you're paying your employees or have other incentives it's been really challenging um, uh, to find really good help um, and people who are willing and wanting to work um, and let me ask you a question related to that yeah. and, and uh, I don't know how you'll feel about this and it may be counterintuitive but would an increase in the minimum wage help you because you just mentioned that if you were to raise wages on tight margins and your competitors didn't do that, it would put you at a disadvantage. But if everyone had to raise to at least the same floor, uh, does that does that help you? Does that help you to retain and, and to be more competitive in attracting employees? So yes and no, right? I think that if we were to raise the minimum wage, and that's actually something I support, but also as a business owner and the type of business that I'm in, the business itself wasn't designed. It was designed for entry level work, right? So high school students, college students, and so forth, and then maybe if I have a manager, general manager, and so forth, then I'm supporting someone who needs benefits in a family. But that's you know one percent of my, you know, that's not a lot of my uh, employee base. So what happens is if I have to raise the minimum wage for you know my 16 year old that's working for me that's just going to work for a year or so, you know, 
then I'm looking at Smitty King like, well, we need to figure out how to automate some things because I can't have as many 16 year olds. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to pay them this, but I'll need fewer of them, right? So it, it is, it is, it's a difficult choice. Yeah. And it doesn't solve it. Businesses like mine weren't designed to support, you know, 10 or 15 in one in one store meeting, right? Um, families and that kind of thing and give a livable wage and that way most of the, my employees are part-time workers and things like that. So it's not what they're living off of, it's extra money and sort of. So in the unique situation that I'm in, um, while it's something that I would support, it would it would make us look back and these are conversations we're having with the franchise or like, hey, how can we take out costs of, in our supply? How can we save costs other places so that if this minimum wage thing comes down the pipe that we're able to meet it? And what that looks like, right? And of course, with negotiating with your suppliers is one thing, but with the cost of everything going up, that's a difficult challenge. So we might not be able to cut all the fat there. So then it's like, well, then I'm going to need to operate this business with fewer employers. So talk to Vitamix, talk to somebody else. How can we automate, mm. get, you know, get a robot or something like that? So what's going to happen is there are going to be fewer workers in the stores, probably. Mm. What, what if there were some back end side of it? So in other words, like certain tax breaks that you could get as a business that would help offset the impact that you're describing to be able to increase the wages, but yet still you see some type of tax break on the, you know, yeah. something whereby no. you have something being extended to you as a small business owner, but because of the fact that you were able to raise those wages. Right. Yeah. I would be open for that. That's not a, that part of the conversation, obviously, we're not having the business with the franchise or because we don't know what the government will do for us. So we're just looking at the business, like how do we how do we figure this out in the business because we know this is coming, it's happening in other states. So it is a huge concern. And models like a, like my business and other you know minimum wage businesses, I just think from the onset they were never designed to really support it. So it's going to be problematic. Besides uh, comments on the panelists' looks, are are there any other <laughs> questions? Or no, they just feel like it's a very powerful conversation and something that should be elevated and brought to light. No, more. no questions from, from no, the, not yet. From folks coming in, that's really helpful to hear. So, our our members, right? We we support impact ventures and social entrepreneurs. They actually don't have a problem right now because they find that more people who have been laid off or who have are in transition in, in their career are looking for impact in their work. They want more meaningful work. We have more people coming to us right now wanting to work for free mm -hmm. um, just to mm -hmm. help us out and do something that is more meaningful as they figure out what their next step is. Mm -hmm. um, we've also seen, I just saw a report in the Chronicle um, as of yesterday, that 1.8 million are still not back in the workforce because we have also a lot of women who have come to us and said they don't have um, they don't have child care, mm -hmm. adequate child care. They don't. They want to make money from home, but they also don't know where to turn. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Ingrid and, and Amanda, we were talking about um, a one-stop shop would be critical, so that this one-stop shop could connect people with education, connect people with capital, connect people with each other, so that if you know there are talent issues, we can find those those things for people. Um, but people can also figure figure out what aligns with both my interests, my passions. Uh, what, what's in my region like that could be so critical and like so powerful in connecting all of these different ecosystems um, so that we can support each other one of the things that we did during the pandemic through impact of houston is we launched a fiscal sponsorship program because a lot of those micro enterprises or early stage entrepreneurs or people who didn't think they were entrepreneurs at all but wanted to solve a problem in their community could access crowdfunding and could access grants so there's so many other ways so many other solutions i guess that could be innovated if we could get a lot of different people together to, to share ideas there was a marketplace of ideas basically in Houston. And to that point, I kind of want to share a little bit on the Hispanic population part. I mean, family support is so huge, especially pandemic. So there was a lot of strength, especially when it comes to women entrepreneurs in the Hispanic community. Um, but I, they also shared that they wish they had like an MBDA, the federal you know, agency, to the state level, where it's just for the micro entrepreneur level. They, they can join chambers, sure, but that's more on the networking special, like, you know, connection. They need it more on the procurement side. They need it to be the subcontractors to the big uh, procurement contract. Mm -hmm. And I think MBDA, <laughs> yeah, and MBDA's requirement is they have to meet a million and above, which is a really high barrier for a lot of the Latino community. So all of the challenges here, here it's that plus the factor of language and culture and even like, you know, background. So if you're a first generation immigrant Latino entrepreneur, the concept of building credit doesn't exist in Latin America. That's a new thing here. Mm -hmm. So the information so of getting bad. that to apply, get credit Papers. as a foundation for your business, you know, they learn it by mistakes or by financial institutions or educations with, you know, our centers, for example. But there's no hub. So if there was a hub similar to a mini MBDA, 
I think that will help. Language is huge. It's so like there's resources in all kinds of languages, you know, it can be a, like a plus. But I think it's the matching of opportunities, a marketplace where you can give procurement opportunities of the big contracts to the little micro entrepreneurs to get to that stage will be a huge opportunity. Great, that's good feedback. Yeah. And I'll share a personal story real quickly. You know, um, my sister uh, was, she has a PhD. She was a um, high school administrator, uh, COVID hit. Um, because of some personal reasons, she decided to retire. She, had been a teacher since she was 23 when she graduated um, and decided to become an entrepreneur. So, um, you know, of course, being able to come to her sister and say, well, I'm, you know, I'm going to do this. And so she went to start filling out her first RFP. And it was the first aha for me that even though we work with a lot of small businesses, um, we assume that certain things are in place. So we have developmental programs to help them develop. But we don't do sort of the um, how to complete an RFP. Mm -hmm. So she was like, where do I go to find out how to complete an RFP? And so I was like, well, go to the MBBA and go to the PTAC Center. And like you said, it was like, well, I got to have a million dollars in revenue in order to be able to do that. And this is my first RFP as an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. right? So I have zero revenue <laughs> in terms of, you know, besides clients that I've picked up from personal relationships, but I'm definitely not at the million dollar mark. Yeah. And um, and so it made me start to think, wow, we have a gap here. Mm -hmm. This is one of those gaps that they talk about where how do you help somebody who has the education, who has the experience, um, who has the knowledge of, of what the subject matter is that she's gonna bid on, but doesn't know how to bid, right? She hasn't been an entrepreneur. She's like, oftentimes, I don't speak the language. Yeah. I don't know the terms. Yeah. I don't, you know, and so I'm, because I'm thinking, well, this is easy, mm -hmm. right? And she's just like, I don't have that. And so we have to help those really small micro and startups to be able to say, here's how you get started. Because I was like, of course, it's a government opportunity. It's in education. It's your sweet spot. Yeah. You've got this. But then yeah. she was like, I don't know how to do that. But I think there's like information workshops. A lot of that, a lot of the networking, there's not the access to actually applying and getting right. contracts. Mm -hmm. So the bidding part process, I think, is where the gap falls. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I also think in the Hispanic community, there's a lot of informal mm -hmm. business yeah. to the formal. So I think mm -hmm. if there's an incentive there, you know, tax break or mm -hmm. a way of, okay, now that you have your LLC, you, you're given like a $500 credit or something, at least to incentivize them to get into formalized. Um, yeah, they usually just started as a hobby or because of survival too. They need it as a supplemental to the family income. Mm -hmm. So if there's an incentive for them to be formalized, I think we can increase. Yeah, I think it's that Brenda mentioned that one of the things that we really struggled with when we started the work of doing Bethany was who do we focus on? Do we focus on stronger businesses? Do we focus on existing businesses? Well, Texas has, well, do we focus on businesses that have done well, but need that opportunity or that support to go to the next level? Uh, Texas has over 200,000 small minority-owned businesses. So we have, you know, all started the businesses, got a website, got business cards, we're passing them out, but how do we really do business? I think mm -hmm. that's what you all are saying. How do we do more than just do what we're good at, but actually scale it? So there is a big, gap in how do we get to that next level. Some of it's funding, some of it's education, some of it's networking, but it leads to the point of there needs to be an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And not one of these things will solve the problem. Right. So Shonda can, can do loans, but guess what? If she doesn't know how to be it, then it doesn't matter. Right. The other part is if she doesn't have relationships in these different industries to become a subcontractor, etc., it won't happen. So the point that I want to just kind of make and hopefully leave with you is it's not just one thing that you can do. You have to really focus on this whole ecosystem of small business because it's so disjointed right now. It has to be a, a real total look at the actual information. And it's, 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 so it's time to wrap. Yeah. Okay. Well, guys, I really appreciate you sharing your insights with him. And I guess if we could just close out on your list if there's one thing oh uh, <laughs> seconds or less since we are out of time and Cynthia's looking at me like 
get out of here. Uh, 15 seconds or less. Any voluntary, anything recommendation strategy wise of what the state could be doing mm -hmm. to help businesses thrive, help wor working families from your vantage point, and of course our ecosystem to grow. Anybody have any suggestions? Have yes, ma'am. Facilitate statewide ecosystem development. So we're facilitating the launch of the Texas Sustainable Business Council across the state with organizations um, in all of the major cities uh, at, to support each other and to help. Um, the, the, there's a 501c4 aspect to it to also advocate um, on behalf of business sustainability and just uh, new energy companies. Um, and the, we need to break the stereotype also of those energy companies because we have um, the first uh, solar farm in Houston that's you know built in a landfill founded by an African American um, entrepreneur. Like there's there's so much that's that's happening that's innovative that's going to women on the minority community um, that if we can have this one place that and that and figure out how to, how everyone works together it opens up markets for everybody and mm -hmm. for so I heard you on that earlier. I wrote that down. I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. A exactly. lot of sense. Because what does good faith mean? Right. Or define or, cl or define very it. Very clearly <laughs> define it. Yeah. But maybe take it out. Yeah. 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 I've drafted good faith in a lot of contracts. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. 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 I don't want to use any of my ones from previously, so I know you have those. But I would also say that I think that we need to look at uh, rural communities. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, that we often think of our urban areas, but even, even though we're called the Houston Council, um, our service territory covers areas that are rural, and there are a lot of gaps mm -hmm. in access to those things Absolutely. in rural areas. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I would love to just, I, I appreciate that you didn't go back, but I'm going to go back. So <laughs> I really do think that this opportunity with the dollars coming into the state, um, as well as really any other pots of funding that can be leveraged, as well, so it's the funding, but it's then also the network and the power of state level government, right? It's both of those things and making sure that they're being put behind initiatives that are actually going to reach rural businesses, black businesses, Latinx businesses, women owned businesses, and being more specific. I think when we try to do these really blanketed initiatives, it gets lost. Yeah. Um, but being really clear about who is not being served. Um, who is in need of service and who's in need of the resources to be able to to grow and scale businesses I think is really going to be critical so um, I would have to be an advocate for you know CDFIs true funds being one of them um, understanding that you know we don't profess to be able to serve all businesses so it's a it's a whole ecosystem right that yeah. is in need of that level of support but there needs to be dedicated dollars and not just the dollars but as was mentioned before that real intentionality and resources behind that to make sure that they're being spent in a way that's appropriate and then also that the knowledge that is had at the state level that is being connected and shared with communities across the state i don't know that the information sharing is going in two directions it may be going into the state or certain things that want to be you know that have been identified are going out but there's not a whole lot of reciprocity there so yeah Okay. One, I know. <laughs> <laughs> One program that I would encourage you to look at is called the Governor's Capital Access Program. Okay. The Governor's Capital Access Program. It's designed to provide a loan loss reserve for banks that want to do loans in minority communities. So it takes away or helps to mitigate the risk of doing loans in those areas. But the program has no funding right now. Mm -hmm. So it exists, but it's like it doesn't exist. Because yep. there is no, the governor has not allocated any funds for this program. But I've never heard of it before, so I yeah. appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. It's yeah. out there. And in other states like Rhode Island, for example, sometimes uh, there are cash deposits that are placed with entities that are willing to increase their their uh, cash deposits are placed with entities that are able to or willing to increase their lending to minorities and women-owned businesses. Mm. So they're an example of one. We tried to. In our, in our book, we talk about the city potentially doing something like that with a banking program. So that's something definitely that there's precedent on mm -hmm. in different places in the country where you can literally put your money where your mouth is in terms of saying, okay, we've got all these cash deposits. we got to put it someplace. Let's put it in places that are actually uh, lending to women and minority business owners. And I think in that space, it gets a little bit broader in terms of, of the group of the population. Uh, the point is putting your money where your mouth is, is, is the point. But one more. Five seconds. Five seconds. I promise. The five seconds is to, to use this 
as a resource and come back. <laughs> Very good. So with that, with that said, we are so grateful that you were here to, and to listen to us share our stories. And we do want to serve as a resource, either with personal stories of this, the work that we've done or continue to do. And we thank you for being here and caring about the issues that matter most to us. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you all. This, this was really, really helpful to me. I know I filled a couple of pages and Gina was right. <laughs> <laughs> so, she was holding the camera and writing at the same time. Very good job. Really good ideas. Really good ideas. Thank you. 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 Thank you.